Hello and welcome to the 7th Annual Bay Area Book Festival. I am Sherilyn Parsons, the festival founder and director. And um, I just first want to wish everyone a happy Mother's Day. Um, very special day. Um, my own mom is watching, of course. So hello, mom. And um, we have a wonderful conversation today, um, a matter of life and death, death and life with the extraordinary authors, um, Joyce Carol Oates and, <clears throat> excuse me, and Irvin Yellow. Um, so let me, um, you know, I wanna mention, you know, 35 years ago, um, Joyce wrote an incredible provocative book on boxing um, that was reissued as a, a Harper perennial modern classic. And um, just to borrow an image from that, I just want to say that today we have two heavyweights, <laughs> um, two real literary legends. Um, so let me start with Joyce. Um, she's a recipient of the National Medal of Humanities, the National Books Critics Circle, Ivan Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award, um, the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in Short Fiction, the Pre Femina, and has been several times nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, she's written more than 100 books, novels, short fiction, essays, criticism, and poetry that are among the most enduring literature of our time. Um, I can't even begin to cite the number that I read, um, but I'll just mention we were the Mulvaney's, Blonde, and the Falls, and particularly want to highlight A Widow's Story. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this. It's got an incredible cover. Um, and I think we're going to be talking more about this book today in particular. Um, so she's the Roger S. Berlin Distinguished Professor of the Humanities at Princeton and has been a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters since 1978. And among her most recent books, which I cannot recommend more highly, is this one, The Other You, which is a collection of short fiction and the gorgeous poetry collection, American Melancholy. Um, so that's Joyce. Let me introduce Dr. Irvin Yalom. Um, he is a professor emeritus of psychiatry at the Stanford University of Medicine. His books have been translated into nearly 30 languages with millions of copies sold worldwide. Um, they include books of what he calls therapy tales, um, Love's Executioner, Mama and the Meaning of Life, um, and more. They're a collection of true and fictionalized accounts of therapy, um, and three teaching novels, as he calls them, um, including When Michi Wept, which I have a copy here, um, Lying on the Couch and The Schopenhauer Cure. Um, his first book, The Theory and Practice of Group Psychotherapy, has been widely used, 700,000 copies, multiple editions, um, as a text for training therapists. And I think any therapist out there watching will know this book. Um, his most recent book, is a matter of life, of death and life, matter of death and life. Um, and that is a memoir co-authored with his wife, esteemed feminist author, Marilyn Yellom, after her cancer diagnosis um, leading up to her death and um, recounted his grief after. They alternated chapters. This was her idea to write a book together um, as they approached her death. It's extraordinary. Um, and since Marilyn is the co-author, I'll mention a little bit about her. Um, she received a PhD in comparative literature, French and German from Johns Hopkins, and has had a highly successful career as a university professor, including in feminist studies and as a writer, including books such as A History of the Breast, A History of the Wife, and with their son, Reed, um, a book called The American Resting Place about um, cemeteries throughout the US. So I think what we're gonna do is I will sort of hover as a light moderator and um, facilitate their conversation, but this is primarily a conversation between the two of them. And I know that Joyce has a question ready to ask, uh, I think Dr. Yalom would prefer to be called Irv. Yes, yes, all right. Um, is he, are you muted or? I should not be muted. You're there. Okay, you're there. Terrific. All right. This weird Zoom environment we have to deal with. All right. So, um, Joyce, please, please take it away. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I, was, I was deeply moved to read this memoir, which is, of course, a collaborative memoir and something completely new to me by Urban and his, his dear wife, 
Maryland. I just found it totally heartbreaking. I wasn't sure whether I could get past about the midpoint. It was very hard for me to pick it up and continue. But if Irv, Irv continued, so I guess the rest of us can continue. And I have many, many responses to it. I found it so memorable and, and beautiful, as well as heartbreaking. But I noticed on, in chapter 29, which deals with denial and sort of paradoxical reactions to grief, I thought, which people don't talk about too much. Irv mentions that he was reading a most interesting memoir of a bereaved husband, The Widower's Notebook by Jonathan Sandlofer. And so I was thinking when I read this, I know Jonathan and a few years ago, we talked about, or I suggested to him that he write a memoir because there are so few memoirs by widowers. Mm -hmm. There are many, many memoirs by widows, but very few by widowers. So this wonderful widower's notebook was, was written by Jonathan. So I was wondering, Irv, if what you thought about the fact that there are so relatively few memoirs by widowers. Oh, I hadn't, hadn't really thought of that at all. The, the book was a really, uh, we were, Marilyn and I were, were walking down this path and parked near our home uh, one day. And she said, you know, I, I think that we, you and I should write this, write a book together about what's happening to me. You write a chapter and I'll write a chapter. And, and I said, you know, Marilyn, that, that's a wonderful idea. But, you know, I've just started another book now. I, I think you should write that book. Marilyn, who is a little less than 100 pounds and five foot, is very tough. She said, oh, no, 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 no. It's not me writing this book. We are writing this book. And uh, so we started to, to write that book together. Um, and um, uh, it, it was uh, extraordinarily uh, important in, in these last years. I, I, I wrote the book in alternating chapters with her until she died. And then I I wrote the second half of the book by uh, by myself, which is primarily about uh, my grief. That's why it's called a matter of death, her death, and life, my life afterwards. Uh, and uh, and I I I wrote about uh, my grief in as as much detail as I as I could. Um, the um, so so anyway, that's how this book that's how this book came to be. It, it was a, a a major event for us. It was something that absorbed us so much uh, right towards the end of her life, and she was writing it just just until just before uh, she died and was unable to do that. Uh, the, the writing of that book uh, helped me get through that and helped me get through her grief as I as I wrote about as I wrote about her grief. I'm still in deep in grief, even though it's it's ended. I'm I'm not doing terribly well with that. I I knew from the beginning uh, that my prognosis was not real good because I've never worked with anyone who's had as long and, and deep a relationship as I've had with Marilyn. We met at 14 and and uh, I've been I've been in love with her ever since then. It is interesting, though, because I think men generally, not you, but men generally find it very difficult to speak candidly and openly about their emotions. Yeah. Of this uh, iconography of men being very masculine and, and without emotion, it's just a cliche and it's not true, but there are relatively few memoirs by widowers. So I think this will take its place as a kind of classic that many people will read this. The chapters following your wife's death were very touching. Mm -hmm. The sense of numbness and the, the absence of meaning from life, but the fact that you continue on and you're, you're continuing on and you wrote and you finished the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's all very, very uh, uplifting. The, the book was was just a lifesaver for me for writing it, and I'm I'm in another book right now for the since I finished that one, and that's that's all that I really look forward to. Let me let me tell you something. I was watching a, a YouTube of you being interviewed three or four years ago, and I'm sorry, it's hard for me to talk a little bit, but I had this fantasy about you. Oh, only I would had you as a teacher. Because uh, <laughs> I've never taken a writing course. I've uh, always uh, took a straight pre-med science course for three years to get quickly into medical school and 
be able to marry Marilyn as quickly as I could. Uh, so I've uh, I've just been writing. I have no idea about how to go about this. I've just been doing it by by pure uh, impulse, uh, reflex in a way. So I had this strange thought: Oh, if only I'd taken your courses. You know, it would such a luxury for me. That's very touching. But you've you've trained yourself to write by reading. That's how we all learn, just by reading many, many books. I, yeah, so that, that has, reading books has been with me from the very beginning of my life. Uh, I, I grew up, as I write about, I think in that book, or perhaps in a memoir that I wrote, I, I lived in a terrible neighborhood the first 14 years of my life and wasn't safe outside. And I spent a lot of time in the library. And I, I literally, almost all my life, except for medical school, I, I read myself to sleep every night with a novel. So I've always been, always been reading. And, um, and, and, in fact, our, our Marilyn and my relationship started with books. I, I, I met her at a party. Uh, I had never talked to a girl before. I think I was 14 then. Uh, I went up to her and got her phone number, and we had a date the next day at something called the Hot Shops in Washington, uh, giving an ice cream sundae. And she told me that she had skipped school that day. I said, what? How do you, you know, I couldn't believe that. And she says, yes, I stayed up all night reading Gone with the Wind and mm -hmm. I put it down until I had to sleep all day. And I was amazed at that. Finally, I found someone who, who's, for whom books were as important as they were for me. So our relationship started with a book and it ended with, with this book. I noticed at one point in your memoir, you speak of your wife, your dear wife, Marilyn, taking up a book. I, I think it was um, a novel by Dickens, and just reading very, be, reading very beautifully to you. And oh, yeah, yes, yeah, she she did that quite often. I, I I was I was loving I was in love with Dickens, and I have a Dickens collection at my house. And so oh. we we watched something on TV of Martin Chuzzlewit, and she sat yeah. there, read the first read the first little pamphlet that came out by Dickens on Martin Chuzzlewit. That was that was one of the great moments in my life. Yes. Can I jump in with a question to Joyce about this, which is you yourself have experienced a lot of grief, particularly as chronicled in the totally extraordinary A Widow story. I mean, I've shared it with so many people. It's just a creed of core. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and so that book is sort of an obvious expression of grief, um, but it's a theme you've explored in so much of your fiction and poetry. Can you just talk about the process of that sort of, I don't know, transposition or whatever into, into literature from your own experience? Well, it's, it's very hard to speak of things that, that don't really have any language. You know, em emotions are perhaps best expressed in music. Hmm. We really can't find the appropriate words for some things. So whatever turns into a text is something that we worked at at sublimation of emotion. And what I try to find some dramatic focus in my writing so that I can dramatize, make something vivid rather than just a statement of fact. Because grief and mourning in themselves are of no particular or original value or even interest because it's a, these are universal experiences that we have through the species. So how does one make one's personal experience somehow of interest to others. I think we have to find some way to make it into a narrative or, or a story. I was uh, aware in, in reading, reading your memoir, uh, following your husband's death, uh, I, I was impressed with, uh, you, you seem quite, quite more courageous than I, you know, looking at his articles, even working in his garden, uh, and I've been extremely avoidant, I still am, I can't look at a picture of my wife, I don't have any up in the house, uh, her, her, her plot in the cemetery is only about maybe 25 minute walk from my house, but I've never gone yet. I'm still very, every time I look at a picture of her or I think of going to the cemetery, you know, I feel like a stab in the heart. And so I, I just still very avoidant of that. I'm, I'm still, I'm still at that stage. Well, you may, there may be compensation in your dreams. 
<laughs> you may be dreaming about her every night. Maybe you might not even remember it, but I'm sure there's some compensatory mechanism. Yeah, yeah. well, that's another thing that's happened to me. Uh, I'm, I'm not having any dreams at all, uh, you know, for, for really for the last year. I don't know if it's got to do with my grief or the fact that I'm using CBD every night, the hemp oil extract, to sleep with. It puts me to sleep very well. I'm sleeping better than I've ever slept before, but I haven't had a single dream, whereas I used to pay a lot of attention to dreams before. Or if you're not remembering them. Or not remembering. That, that may well be. Not you're having dreams. You just don't remember them. Yeah, yeah that's true. I, you're right. I, I am definitely having dreams. And if I were wired up, they, it, they'd be able to tell, but I don't remember any of them. Well, that's the, but they're nourishing and they're probably helping you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm slowly making progress. But um, but my 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 grief is in, entirely treated by by my writing. That's all I'm doing now. I'm uh, I'm I've stopped doing psychotherapy, ongoing therapy, because my, my uh, I'm going to be ninety in a couple in a few weeks now. My memory is beginning to flake away, and my memory is not good enough to to do ongoing therapy. So I'm I'm just seeing patients for a single consultation, and I see a patient every day. And do a consultation, and and I'm finding out of every 10, 15, uh, maybe 20 hours that I see that, that there's a story that begins to emerge in my mind, and uh, and that's it's a lifesaver for me. That's I look forward to that, and I greatly enjoy the writing. Well, I noticed that you mentioned that you're losing your um, the memory that you must once have had must have been prodigious because. Through the memoir, you mentioned you're losing your memory or you can't quite remember things. And I was thinking I'm surrounded by people in Princeton who are 40 years younger, and they're, in this, they're the same way. I mean, basically, you probably remember about as well as somebody much younger than you, but maybe your standards of memory are higher, that's all. Yeah, well, the worst the worst episode happened yesterday. I was looking at an email that I got. Who is this person? I don't know who he is, but somehow I felt warm towards him. Uh, but I didn't know who he was. I sent it off to my daughter to tell me who who is this person. She says that's the man who lives two houses away from you. You know, he's been away for a month and he's writing. He's come back from from a from a trip. Uh, so it's it's that sort of thing. I you know I I forget things that are, are so obvious to me. But uh, you know I I'm I'm seeing my memory diminished a lot. That's why I stopped doing ongoing therapy now. It's it's definitely uh, very flaky. But also our memories are getting filled up. When you consider if you're almost 90 years old, how many names, how many names can be in your neurons? You know, somebody who's only 20 years old has not had so many years experience. That's a very, that's a very interesting comment. Oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. I have had thousands and thousands of students. Uh -huh. Years I started teaching a long time ago, and it would be impossible to remember them all. But you, but you tend to remember faces. How are you with faces? Much better. Yeah. Uh, the, the faces are much better. Oh, yeah. There is thought to be an explicit and an implicit memory where you can sort of remember feelings, and they're one part of the brain, and the names in another part of the brain. So if I see this person, I feel very warm towards them. I have the sense of familiarity, but, right. but the name comes very slowly. Yes, because a part of your brain is activated that you're, it's not necessarily your, your, you know, your active memory. Mm -hmm. Well, Oliver Sacks, you know, didn't recognize any faces, mm -hmm. including his own face in a mirror. Yeah, right. I remember that. Yeah, I've been reading about him. <laughs> well, maybe, um, Joyce, maybe Irv was one of your students. <laughs> 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 and neither of you remember. <laughs> right? I don't remember. No, I remember the names, and I remember some faces, and even something of, of what they've done. Mm -hmm. But only if you know, only if I see the name or somebody writes to me, I I couldn't sit down and tell you who I was teaching in 1979. Mm -hmm. I could not remember. I don't that kind of memory. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody has. Yeah, and it happens very clearly if I see a patient, someone who I'd seen 10 or 15 years before. I don't remember any details, but what I do feel is a real sense of familiarity with this person. I feel warm towards this person, but I can't remember any of the details. Yeah. 
It all comes back. It would come back within a few minutes if they talk to you. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that this is like all of us to some degree with the pandemic, <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody's brain is just over full with is managing. Um, you know, we have so many questions that are coming in from the audience that were pre-submitted and that um, have been coming in right now. And I know you have other questions, but occasionally, if it's all right, I might insert one. I'm just watching them pour in. Sure. And, you know, one of them, when we when we think about grief, um, you know, you've both written about love, you know, it's like the other side of grief, right? You know, there wouldn't be grief if there wasn't this intense love. And one question that came in, and I cannot remember who, who asked it, um, Jennifer asked, if you could share your secrets to a long-lasting marriage. You've both written a lot about that. So let's see, Joyce, can you start? Well, that, that makes me feel very modest and sort of humble because everybody who gets married, I mean, really everybody is hopeful and is sure that they're really in love and had married the right person. And so that's how we felt, and it turned out to be true. And I've actually been married twice, and both my husbands passed away. And But I always felt, you know, that this was absolutely the right person. However, many people feel that way, and the, and the marriages do not turn out well. So I, I would have to say in all modesty that much in, much in life is accidental. Mm-hmm. And we are sometimes lucky. Uh, Irv r- walked over to a 14-year-old girl who turned out to be the perfect person, but who might not have been at that gathering. He might actually never have met her, but he might have met somebody else who was not quite right. Mm-hmm. In other words, accidents so much guide our lives. Mm-hmm. Yes, that, that is true. Some, somehow I, I, I heard, had this meeting with Marilyn and... I, I I never wanted to let her go, was, and I don't know what there was about her. She was tiny, uh, always was. Uh, we 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 talked about we talked about books all the time, um, and she and she was also an excellent editor. Always my first reader. I was always hers, but she 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 was much much better editor than I was. Once we were away at a. a Bellagio, which is a Rockefeller uh, retreat for for writers uh, in in um, in Italy, and uh, so I had won this award, and we were there for uh, a month or two, and they they gave us an apartment for the family, and then they would give the winners of this award uh, a, a special writing studio. So I had a writing studio, and and Marilyn uh, was talking to me about she had been reading about women and their writings about the French Revolution for uh, who were alive during the French Revolution, and she was talking about how. You know, these are very interesting stories. And I listened to her and I said, you know, there, there might be a book in there, Marilyn. And the more she thought about it, she said, you know, she's going to write a book. So we asked, I went over, we went with her to the Rockefeller Center in, in Bellagio and asked whether or not she could, there was another office for her, a writing office. And they said, no, not for spouses. So there's no offices. But just then the head of the uh, head of the institute walked through and said, wait a minute, there, there's an office, there's a free one. And we walked down in the forest in Bellagio for oh, about five or 10 minutes. And there was a, a big tree with a ladder coming down. So we climbed up the ladder and there was a, a studio in there. So she climbed up in that studio and loved it. So that's when she started to write her book uh, uh, about women observers of the French Revolution. And from that point on, she matched me book for a book. Uh, we were we were both writing books. She wrote as as many as I did, and we were always uh, each other's first reader. You had a really magical marriage. You you were soulmates. We were. So, other than the happenstance of meeting your soulmate, um, how did it? continue. I mean, Irv, you know, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that at one point, um, you know, Marilyn was very caught up in her, you know, Center for Women at Stanford. And you were like, this isn't working for me. And then another time it wasn't working for her. So how how did it sustain? 
Well, the the one time that I really confronted her, this was after she was teaching at a nearby college. Stanford would not hire uh, uh, professors' wives, so she taught at a nearby college. Uh, and but then they offered her a position as as head of the women's center, so she was very much engaged in feminist issues at that time. And after a year or two, uh, I began I began to see less and less of her. She was entirely engaged, and we. I don't know if this is in this this book, but we we were sitting in a restaurant in San Francisco, and and I said to her, you know, Marilyn, I'm not I'm not getting much out of this marriage any longer. I I wonder whether we should continue, and her response for that was to uh, start weeping very loudly. Everyone in the restaurant turned around and looked at her bawling like that. And she didn't stop. It went on for five or 10 minutes. That's the last time I ever mentioned the, such a thing to her. Uh, and things changed after that. But that was the only time that we ever had this, came this close to thinking out of marriage. Or my thinking, this marriage isn't working, not working for me. That's very dramatic. Gosh, mm-hmm. I can't imagine saying that to a spouse. Yeah. Must have been very, very, very devastating. Yep. Sounds like something in a Joyce Carol Oates novel. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would never have said anything like that. No. <laughs> um, like, love is too fragile. It's like a little vessel mm-hmm. and it can be broken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're lucky that she didn't. Yep. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like the end because I've heard of situations like that when a husband says something like that, not exactly seriously, and the wife says, all right. <laughs> and you know, once, once you've broken some sort of trust, mm-hmm. but anyway, it didn't, it didn't happen with you. No, it didn't, it didn't happen with me. You, Sherilyn was asking what sort of um, methods or machinations or Machiavellian strategies to keep a marriage going. Well, the only one that I could really think of very offhandedly is I never tell either husband anything ever that would distress him mm-hmm. unless it was absolutely necessary. And it doesn't happen that often. In other words, I had a life that was very somewhat secretive. I never confided in my husbands in any way that would make them unhappy, even for a minute, like if something happened in my professional life, even when I was being stalked by someone or got awful letters, I never shared those facts with my husband or maybe with anybody. Not talking now because it's like, you know, it's it's like looking into the void. So I didn't have a relationship with either of my husbands that was 100% um, truthful or or candid or open. I saved that for my writing. Mine was a little different. I think every everything uh, everything was was shared uh, with her. There's no, no we, we we shared almost everything. So it was a little different. I was I was interested in your. And when I read your memoir about your husband not having read your many of your books, uh, and I, I didn't quite understand how that would work. How did you feel about his not reading the books? Was he curious to know what you were writing? How did that work out? Most people who know me socially or in my family don't know me. Mm-hmm. They don't know my inner self because that's my writing self. Mm-hmm. And people who know my books don't know me in a social sense. Mm-hmm. Because our personalities are complex. You said that you shared everything with your wife and your wife shared everything with you. You don't really know exactly. <laughs> like my husbands didn't know that I wasn't sharing things with them. We don't know what we don't know. Mm-hmm. There are many very upsetting things that happened to me in my life that I never told any, I've never told anyone about. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't dream of upsetting another person needlessly. Uh, for me, t- telling her was it was healing for me, and I think helpful for for our relationship. And it was the same with her. She she withheld very very little from me, as far as I know. We were always extremely extremely close uh, all, all of our lives. Well, my husband may have thought I was open with them too. 
<laughs> That's the whole idea. You just want, you want the other person to be happy. Mm -hmm. and, um, also, both my husbands were very, very engrossed in their work. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to have my own, my own being. So mm -hmm. it's like a, a personality that was like a moon in eclipse. We don't see the other side of the moon. We see the, the bright side of the moon, and we don't see the other side of the moon. Yeah. And there's no need to see that. Well, it is true. I really, I did. I never talked about my professional life with her. We never talked about patients. That, that was how much of my day was taken. That, yes, I, that's true. I did not share that part of uh, my work with her, my life with her. Mm -hmm. And if you had some bad, bad experience with a with a patient or something wasn't going right, you probably wouldn't share that either because that's you would think that was your own work and your own problem. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably share that with a colleague first. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. This is so interesting. I mean, Joyce, what you're saying is there's like the 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 private self and then the social self yeah. and then the romantic or you know partner self, but the personal self is channeled for you into the writing. I, I mean, it it's is that the is that what you're saying? It's it's like I've always thought, you know, it's funny with, with a book, it's like, okay, there's a physical book, right? And it's sort of this barrier, but it's really the most intimate access, uh, you know, into a writer, even if it's not, quote, autobiographical. And the reader is also being so vulnerable. I mean, you're opening yourself to change. That's why you're reading, is to be yes. touched. Yes. Well, the books are very different, too, and they're different voices and different modalities of fiction of consciousness in the books too i mean the books seem to be written and maybe in some cases they would seem to be written by different people mm -hmm. my, my concept of the human personality is it's extremely malleable extremely complex but most of it is not accessible to consciousness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's like a deep body of water and we're, we're on the surface. So we don't know ourselves very well. Mm -hmm. We certainly don't know other people very well, but we can assume that there's this deep reservoir of the, of the unfathomable beyond language too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm a therapist who works very, very much in the here and now. So I'll, I'll, I'll spend, a, even in these single session consultations, that I do, I spend a good part of that of that session at the here and now looking at exactly what's happening between the two of us. And for a lot of the people that I see who haven't had that kind of therapy, someone I just saw uh, a couple of hours ago, you know, whereas I, I was trying, she's working primarily with, with cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'm saying, you know, I, I think you've, you've got to take a look at a kind of therapy where you're examining what's happening between the two of you. So I spend a lot of time on the here and now with, with each patient. I do that in groups. Uh, I was sort of brought up at, at the time that I, I was trained in psychiatry. It was it was a time that uh, the whole interpersonal as, aspect of therapy was was then was then common. There was a, a, a psychiatrist named Harry Stack Sullivan who contributed a lot, rather than just looking at early life and early fantasies in life, but taking a look at, at chumships and friendships and and certainly when you do group therapy, which I got interested in very early, just in early in my training. You know, the, the point of group therapy is to examine what's happening between the members of the group right now in this group in the here and now. So I, I focus a whole lot on, on what's happening be between people. So, uh, and I, I that, that of course, leaks over to what's happening between Mary and Marilyn. I'm so, I'm so very accustomed to looking at well, what's going on right now. What are you feeling at this moment? What did my feelings cause you to, what did my statements cause you to feel? So I'm much, I'm very comfortable doing that. And uh, many therapists feel that's, that, you know, that, that's taking things too, uh, too far, uh, or that you're revealing too much of yourself. And I've often, uh, been criticized in, in, by therapists for for sharing too much of myself, but I I tend to be quite revealing even during my therapy with patients. Well, Freud spoke about the power of the transference, and you obviously have been a, a wonderful, very very helpful, um, gracious, ki kindly, and and loving or seemingly lo loving therapist, so that 
you're you are ev- evoking in your patients probably a wish perhaps unconscious on their part to please you and to do what you want them to do so they get better <laughs> i mean it sounds magical but the transference is real and there's a counter and there's a counter transference too you sort of fall you fall in love with the sound of your own voice because you are actually healing people you are doing good and it's something that's a mutually beneficial experience it's not unlike teaching mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah I, I tend to be far i think i tend to be far more self-disclosing uh, in the therapy situation than most than most therapists are, are, are do that that's that's been with me for a long time they can't quite tell you how it started i know when i first started to teach group therapy at, at stanford We'd have students watch through a one-way mirror. My residents were maybe six, seven, eight, ten of them behind the mirror. And, and they were watching the group. The group knew that I would be meeting with them afterwards. And they were kind of uncomfortable about that and talked about that. And somehow, I, I, someday I suggested, well, let's try an experiment. At the, at the end of this group, I want all the group members to go into the observation room. And they're going to observe me talking with the students, with the residents, about the group. And that changed everything. Uh, the residents were rather frightened by that, of being observed by a patient, but it went, it went extremely well. Uh, and and I, I think it really, uh, it, it, it gave therapy a, a, a real jolt and really moved it along. I, I saw a patient who had dropped out of the group because she had moved, but she was very difficult to approach. She was very hidden, very shy. And I couldn't get her to open up or to talk about what's happening between the two of us. So I said, she was a writer, a professional writer. I said, well, why don't we each write a summary of each meeting? And then, uh, and then after the summary, we'll, we'll mail it to each other. And she was willing to do that. And that worked quite, quite wonderfully. And many months after that, uh, I know a family was going on a ski trip. Marilyn had hurt her ankle, I think. And she said, and I gave them to her to let them look at it. And she started reading them. She said, you know, there's a book in here somewhere. And uh, eventually the patient that I published this book, it's called Every Day Gets a Little Closer, which contained our two summaries and then our, our feelings about what had happened after, after reading each other's summary. That was one of the very, very first books I had written. Well, you, it sounds as if you are really a wonderful therapist and have helped so many people. And looking at your memoir w- written with Marilyn, it's just very beautiful. Many people would get a, a good deal of wisdom out of it, I think, just by you know your example. Yeah, thank you. And I jump into, um, we've had a few questions. Um, one person said, um, Earth isn't like losing your memory a form of losing yourself. And I also was thinking through this conversation about Joyce's um, short stories, this one, um, The Other Self, which think about the title. I mean, it's so much about sort of visions of the self. I mean, these stories kind of interact, they come back. It's imagining different iterations of a life and different ways of sort of envisioning circumstances I mean totally fascinating often hilarious Mm -hmm. and um, I I guess just thinking about the self um, and then the self in relationship with um, and then one of the things we talked about in creating this event and that some audience members are asking about is the sense of um, sort of how the self arrives at a sense of um, I don't know, completion, satisfaction, happiness. Um, Irv, I know you've talked about how you now don't fear death because you've lived a life that um, is full, like that you, you've lived a rich life, the life you wanted to have. And one thing Joyce explores in this, in this story collection is our regrets. The very first story actually is very much about this, about a woman who wants to be a writer and Um, So I'm wondering if you could each address this question about living a life without regrets. Mm -hmm. Sure. Irv, why don't you start? Okay. I've been seeing a lot of patients, even in these single session consultations, 
uh, who come to me because of death anxiety, and and a formula that I've been uh, that I've been using a great deal is the formula that 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 if you're if you're living a life full of regrets, you're going to experience a lot of death anxiety. Uh, if you lived a life with with few, it'll be much less so. Uh, so I will focus very much on the on the regrets they have about the way they're living now and what could be changed. Um, I, I know that's that's that is different from me you know that as i think about as i think about death now i find myself with with far far less death anxiety uh than ever before because i feel that i have very few regrets about my life uh it's 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 been a life that's far richer far more full than i could have ever thought coming from the you know parent, from a, being a child of a of an emigrated couple who spoke very little, uh, spoke poor English and had no education and uh, grew up in, in that neighborhood. So I, I you know, I, I feel very, very little regrets about my life, uh, very little anxiety about, about death. Um, so when I, when, I, when I think about death now, it's, 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 it's something that is, is, doesn't, doesn't trouble me so much. Um, I think about late. Sometimes recently, I've been thinking about uh, that when I die, I'll be I'll be joining. Well, this is slightly off the topic, but I'll say this anyway. When I die, I'll be joining. I'll be joining Marilyn, and somehow that gives me some real sense of comfort. Even though my my the rest of my mind knows that that's absurd. You know, I'm not going to be joining Marilyn. I've been uh, a fairly uh, devout atheist almost as far as I as long as I can remember but even though I know that that intellectually it doesn't make any sense that still the sense that I'll be joining Merrill and that feeling I get this whole sense of comfort it gives me an idea of the importance of religions what religions have had to offer us all through the all through the the, 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 the centuries uh, of uh, that the, the death isn't the end, even though intellectually I know that it is, or I feel that it is. What exactly was the question again? The <laughs> yeah, well, I was referring to your um, collection of stories, in particular, the other you, with the way that it explored like potential outcomes and regrets, and even the first story is really directly about a woman wanting to be something, in this case, a writer and not achieving that. Um, so the question of living without regrets. Well, I certainly don't, I certainly wouldn't put myself in that category. I feel very, very incomplete, very dissatisfied, very frustrated. Um, I'm sort of caught, I'm entangled in a kind of great mystery, you know, as in the, as in the great, um, tentacles of some beast or something. I just feel that I'm very, um, not trapped exactly, but just very frustrated. I don't know. I don't have the feelings that, that Irv has expressed. Maybe because I'm a novelist and novelists tend to take on um, sort of the colorations of different settings. Like I can imagine myself in a different setting. I would be a different person. Maybe I took an easy way. Maybe my writing has been a way that's it's been compensatory for a different kind of life that I that I never led. The one on the whole areas of my of my of knowledge that I don't have. I'm so deficient in mathematics. I don't know anything about physics. I know so little about the universe. You know, uh, the whole the oceans, the de the depth of the ocean. I know nothing, virtually nothing about. Like I probably know about one percent of what there is to know. And I'm never going to get to, I'm not even going to get to know it now because I'm still working so hard on something that I'm trying to do. It's sort of a wordy answer for, um, for your question. But in terms of my actual book, The, uh, the Other You, it's really exploring that fine line between what you might have been and what you are. Yeah. Like the girl who doesn't, she can't do well on the exam because her father's an alcoholic. She's awake all night because her parents are arguing. She takes an exam and she doesn't do well, so she doesn't leave her hometown. That didn't happen to me. I was the girl 
who had a good family. I, my father wasn't an alcoholic. I took the exams. I did well. I got a scholarship. So I'm kind of exploring the lives that that we that some of us have left behind. Like, what would it have been like not to have this life, but to have had that other life? And there's happiness and joy and fulfillment in that other life. After Marilyn died, I, I was sort of just sort of numb. I could hardly move. I stayed in bed for a long time, and I started reading my own books. Uh, I, I think I read almost almost not the textbooks, but I started to read all the other books, and and somehow that was a tremendously good therapy for me. Uh, it 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 left me feeling this I this sense of of no regrets. I said, "Oh, did I did I do this? Did I do this?" I was so I was uh, that 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 helped me get shuck any kind of regrets that I had about the life I had. I was very very pleased with the books. Far more far better than than anything I think I I might have done uh, in any other time. You were very lucky because you did meet your soulmate, and she was your companion for. So many years, I think that like point one zero zero one percent of all humanity has anything like that, you know. So, I would say that you were very lucky, and and overall, I have been lucky too. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we represent probably anyone except ourselves. Yeah. Wow, I, I, also, yeah. I also felt that when my wife died, that a lot of my past was going to disappear. Because she had this extraordinary memory, and and the things happen to me now, or I'm thinking, oh, where did I write this book? I know I was somewhere, maybe it was on by an ocean. I'm not sure, but but I, I knew that when she died, I was going to lose all that, and that certainly come to pass. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if any of you are like looking in the chat <laughs> at the same time there's so much going on sort of you know in this conversation and people are really appreciative of your vulnerability um in this conversation um you know there have been a few questions about how do we come to a place of living without regrets i mean i'm more in joyce's camp <laughs> like there's so much you know that I don't know or that I wish I did but I guess maybe take the wish I did part mm -hmm. I mean Irv what would you say to that oh I should have done this or that so I don't I can't think of that I think I've done I, where I started you know when I was 14 or 15 I had no idea or imagination I could do as well as I have that I could have written these books uh, so I, I, I'm just had the opposite. I'm, I'm almost in in awe of 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 what I've been able to do and how I've been able to help people, and and uh, I, I'm enjoying that very much now. Uh, as I, I I can't really give up, you know, at least these consultations. I, I I so much enjoy offering things to people when I have something to offer. So uh, I I couldn't possibly have imagined that I would have turned out as well as I did. Yes, I feel somewhat of the same way because I come from a family where no one had even graduated from from high school in all of my family. No one had even thought about going to college. And my parents were wonderful people, but they had to drop out very young. During the Depression, they were working when they were like 12 years old. You know, they didn't have any opportunity. So I grew up in a household where there were no books. And nobody expected anything of anyone. So I never had to try to live up to someone's expectations of me, which I think is not the case um, around me in Princeton. Most, most families have relatively high expectations for their children, and that's very natural. I mean, they, they hope they'll go to an Ivy League university and do well. But nobody in my family expressed anything like that for me. So I didn't have that pressure on me, and, and that was very fortunate. Yeah, certainly. I I had slightly different versions. My 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 parents were had no education whatsoever. Spoke poor English, uh, uh, but they would they would give me anything if I wanted to buy a book. That that was that was for sure. Uh, take me to the library. That was for sure. So they cared about that. 
And I, I wrote in the book about the fact of that my mother, my father died when he was quite young of a, of a coronary, but my mother lived uh, until into her into her eighties, uh, and at the end of her life, she was almost blind. She was in a, um, a residential uh, situation, and she would sit in her wheelchair, and my books were piled up on the floor next to her. She couldn't read them, but she would pet them in a way and, and show them to people. Uh, when they would come by. And I so I had felt so good that I was able to offer her that. Where were your parents from? They were from, uh, some. my father used to say, uh, if it was it was in Russia, but if they didn't want another long Russian winter, they would call it Poland. It was very near the border. And yeah. Poland was from a tiny, from a tiny, okay. a tiny little village in, in, in Russia. That, is that the pale? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I think so. They they, um, they grew up in a, a very uh, uh, they pronounce it Celts, and, and they my parents belonged to what they called the Celt Society because there were about oh fifteen of them who had who had moved to Washington D.C. and every Sunday they would all get together they called it the Celt Society, uh, and we would uh, you know we would spend Sunday evenings together the men played pinochle the women played canasta. Um, and and the children played other games between us, um, but there was a rule g going on that I've just been interested in now, because th there's one thing they would not talk about, and that was the Holocaust, and they had all experienced parts when, of it. When did, of, when did they come to America? They came about 1922. Oh, um, wow! They came early. Yeah, they came early, but oh. many of the members of the family came later. My uncle. My uncle Abe came over, but it, it was too late to take over his wife and children, so they were all killed by the Nazis. And a sister of my father's never came over. So they, they, uh, there was a kind of taboo. They never talked about this in front of the children. Yeah. And I, it, it's recently been re-evoked for me because I've been, uh, I, I've been working with a patient uh, I, in a consultation I've written, I've been writing a story about her, well, we've been writing it together now, whose father was a Nazi and killed a great many Jews in, in Russia. And she has been donating four months a year teaching psychotherapy in Israel uh, ever since as a, as a way of atoning uh, for what the for what her father had done in the war. So well, we, uh, all these ideas of this Holocaust have suddenly reemerged for me. I haven't thought of them for years. And it's been curious to me as I started thinking about that and thinking, yeah, none of the family, I've been talking to my cousins recently, all the people who came to these Sunday me, it was taboo. Their parents never, never talked about the Holocaust in front wow. of the children. I don't think the Holocaust was spoken of in, in America very generally until mm -hmm. a certain point. Yeah. It began to be gradually spoken of, and we can see why it's been so much in denial. Yeah. My, grand, my, one, my father's mother was Jewish, but she came with her family of, in the early 20th when did, she, when did she come? Well, the early 20th century, but she never told us that she was Jewish. There's a whole, I mean, there's probably a lot of people who come from Europe who were Jewish. Who, who wanted to put behind them the terrible, bloody history of the pogroms and, and the terrible discrimination and anti-Semitism. They came to this country and they just didn't want to continue ident identifying as Jewish. So all during her lifetime, we never knew she was Jewish. But in retrospect, she, she was my only relative who gave me books, yeah. who bought typewriters for me, who was, was intellectual and loved music and loved the art, but it's only retrospectively because I did not know that grandmother at all. Like, I guess like me, she was a very secretive person. She right. didn't talk about herself at all. Right. Yeah. So this is a remarkable woman in that she teaches uh, psychotherapy in Israel four months a year. She donates that time as, as a way of atoning for what her father had done to the Jews. Uh, it's it's a very moving story that she writes about. Uh, I read the story with her uh, because one of the students, when she did that, one of the students in Israel uh, said, "We've been waiting for you." 
so I, she she found that very moving. That's what I'm I'm entitling the story. We've been we've been waiting for you for for someone who's somehow making making up atoning for what happened to you all. So I'm having I'm having a great time writing that story. I'm writing it right in the midst of it right now as we're as we're working. We're beginning to close on our hour, um, and. I want to pose um, at least one more question from the audience. And then if there's any final questions that the two of you have for each other, um, I apologize to all of you audience members who have submitted just amazing questions. Oh. I mean, many of them just very vulnerable and we will share these um, with Joyce and Irv just so yeah. they see what, you know, this has evoked um, in, in the people watching. Um, two questions I want to sort of combine. And this one comes from Diane and it says, for Joyce, did you want to escape your sadness or stay with your sadness? And when and how did you decide it was okay to try to leave your sadness behind? And then she says, question from a recent widow of a 46 year marriage. Then there's a follow-up or a separate question that came from Heidi which says, what keeps us stuck in grieving for so long? Is there an end to grieving? It's been 15 years since the passing of my loved one by suicide, and I'm still at sea and a shadow of who I used to be. Well, all I can say is speaking from my own experience, I, um, I immediately went back to, to work and I did, my, I did my usual life. I think I was lucky because I would rather have stayed home and crawled in bed or even under the bed. I didn't have any energy, which is typical of all bereaved people. But because I had a job and I had responsibilities, so I got up in the morning and did all the things that one does, and I went out. And I think that makes a difference. When you go out, you are basically performing, and much of what we do is somewhat theatrical when we're with other people. And if we're professors or, or therapists, we have to be professional. Mm -hmm. So that helps us. I think, the, I think it's really debilitating and a mistake just to stay home and sort of succumb to the grief because it's depression has no product. It's tiring and corroding of the spirit. I mean, the least you could do is go out and volunteer, say, at an animal rescue shelter. There's something that you can do. So that's what I would recommend. Uh, I, I ran groups of, of grieving people, spouses for, for a great many years and always always found that that useful. And for most of the people, it, it uh, many of the people felt better at the end of one year, but most of the people in the group really were required a couple of years. But it was, it was very helpful for them to be in a group of people with whom they could share this with and be and be and feel that the others could really empathize with them. Um, so I, I I loved doing that group, and I felt it was so helpful to people. Terrific, thank you. Um, so I don't know if you have any final questions you want to ask each other, or I have one more from the audience that I could bring in. So what would what would you prefer? Well, I, I have something that I quote from um, Irv's book, and this is a phrase that he uses a couple, several times, really, of, from Nietzsche: "Many die too late, and some die too early. Die at the right time." That's this very famous remark of Nietzsche's. So I wonder what Nietzsche, I wonder what Nietzsche actually meant by that. <laughs> I, I love the phrase, but I can't tell you what he what he meant by, by that. But die at the right time. What what does that mean? Um, I was thinking that he may or he he may not have been speaking in terms of individuals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He himself did not die at the right time in his own life. No. Have been speaking of sort of cultural, even political movements that mm -hmm. uh, he was so critical of Christianity, which he saw as a, as a slave religion uh, and a kind of uh, resentment. Mm -hmm. It may be that cultural movements should die so that something new and more, more life affirming mm -hmm. could be born. But I have also been haunted by Nietzsche. Yeah. 
Yeah. And there are many aphorisms of Nietzsche that are lodged very deeply in, in my brain. So, you know, many die too, too soon and some die too late. I say unto you, die at the right, right time. At the right time, yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I lived with Nietzsche for a couple of years when I, I wrote that novel about him a long time ago. Um, profound. He's very profound. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. Freud, Freud learned everything from Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. And I want to close us on a line um, from Joyce's poetry book, um, American Melancholy. And it's a poem called The Tunnel. Um, and it evokes Nietzsche, actually, in that particular poem. Um, Emma Breit and others. The last line of the poem is in italics and it's set in its own stanza. And I think we should end on this. And um, then I'll do some closing comments, but for our conversation here, the line says, oh love, where will you abide when our frail bodies are no more? Quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you both, Irv and Joyce, for the gifts of your books and your wisdom and your time today. Um, we're grateful at the festival and I think the audience is very grateful given the comments and so on that we've been receiving. Mm -hmm.